Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Better Data, Fewer Mice. Micro CT imaging breathes new life into your lung research. I am Judy O'Rourke of Labberts, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by Perkin Elmer. Perkin Elmer is a global leader committed to innovating for a healthier world. Their innovative detection, imaging, informatics, and service capabilities, combined with deep market knowledge and expertise, help customers gain earlier, more accurate insights to improve lives and the world around us. For more information about our sponsor, please visit PerkinElmer.com. Let's get started. You can pose questions to the speakers during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your screen labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the arrows at the top right-hand corner of the presentation window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by typing it into the answer a question box located on the far left of your screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I now present today's speakers, Dr. Christian Dulin, Dr. Sasha Belenkov, and Dr. Francesca Ruschetti. Dr. Dulin studied technical physics at the Friedrich Schiller University, Jena, and finished his thesis based on extracting the 3D skull out of MRI datasets in 2001. In 2004, he moved to the Institute for Diagnostic and Interventional Radiology at the University Medical Center Göttingen, UMG, where he was responsible for technical aspects of preclinical imaging. He finished his PhD on novel imaging strategies for preclinical lung research in 2015. During this time, he was part of several European projects, one of which was the Public-Private Partnership for Asthma Genomics and Imaging. His work there is also predominantly dedicated to lung imaging. Dr. Dulin has founded his own subgroup at the UMG focused on X-ray-based preclinical imaging techniques. His complete bio is found on the LabRoots website. Dr. Belenkov is an applications scientist at Perkin Elmer. Sasha has been working in the field of preclinical imaging for more than 10 years. In his current role, he is responsible for the development and support of novel imaging applications and approaches. Prior to joining Perkin Elmer, he worked for Vizin Medical, GE Healthcare, and ART Advanced Research Technologies. He received his Bachelor's of Science in Anatomy and Molecular Biology and PhD in Experimental Medicine at McGill University, Montreal, Canada. Dr. Ruschetti is a scientist focusing on in vivo imaging in the pharmacology department at Chiesi Farmaceutici in Parma, Italy. After graduating, Francesca started in the Laboratory of Anatomy at the Hospital of Parma, investigating the role of PKC in cancer. After a period as a research fellow at the Institut Marie Curie in Paris, studying the immune system and HIV. She joined Chiesi Company and started to work with imaging techniques such as bioluminescence, fluorescence molecular tomography, and computed tomography applied to preclinical animal models. During this time, she completed her PhD in experimental respiratory physiopathology and functional diagnostics for images of the cardiopulmonary system. Dr. Dulin, Dr. Belenkov, and Dr. Ruschetti will now begin their presentations. Yeah. Hello, everybody. The, my name is Christian Dallen. I'm from the University Medical Center uh, Göttingen, Germany, and I'd like to show you how the Perkin Elmer Quantum Micro CT Imaging System can be used not only to measure uh, structural changes in lung disease models, but also to measure lung function in mouse models. And of, um, of course, function is a very important parameter because that's directly related to the symptoms in patients. So we work with um, asthma models in mice, and we use an over-albumin-induced uh, model. 
And depending on the schedule and on the amount uh, of overalbumin we inject, we can produce uh, different gra uh, grades of severity. So in the middle, you can see uh, in the upper panel um, control mouse, and then you see a mild asthmatic uh, asthma model and a severe asthmatic model. And you see that there's a large amount of uh, influx of uh, immune cells and the swelling of the bronchi. We use the quantum FX in vivo CT from Perkin Elmer, which is a very versatile machine and can measure very fast with a low amount of radiation. And it also has a live modus um, for positioning the mouse that can be exploited to record movies of the breathing mouse. And these are some frames of um, such a movie. So you can see that uh, you see that a change in the um, shape of the lung during inspiration. And you also see that the brightness in the lung area is modulated by the different amount of air. So what we can do first is to analyze uh, this brightness. And you see if, we, um, if there's an inspiration event, it gets brighter. And we can also easily analyze the motion of the diaphragm. So under anesthesia, the, most of the time the mouse is in expiration and there are only few events of inspiration. So if we simply average all the time frames, then we get the shape of the um, lung in expiration. And if we measure the standard deviation over time, the, the part that moves the most um, will give the highest values. So what you see on the uh, right uh, side is that we can easily measure the traveling distance, uh, distance of the diaphragm. And already these easy measurements give uh, some very interesting um, ways of quantification of um, lung function. And we use this in a study to analyze mice that have recovered from asthma. So we measured uh, the mice before um, provoking an asthma attack. We measured them directly after an asthma attack, and we measured them 121 days later. On the left side, you see the asthmatic, uh, uh, one mouse of the asthmatic group, and on the right side, you see a control mouse. And what you can see is that um, there is more motion in the asthmatic mouse, and you can also see by the white arrowhead that there's also motion on the chest. So the mouse tries to compensate the loss of lung function by uh, using the intercostal muscles. And by quantification, you see, uh, you see in the center of the slide that after 120 days, the area of the lung comes back to normal. Also, the, the position of the diaphragm comes back to normal, and, um, and also the width of the lung comes, uh, comes back to normal. But there are still some slight modifications. And um, to really quantify that, we developed a more soft, uh, sophisticated analysis scheme, which I am about to show you now. So if you um, record all these um, movies and measure the change of the brightness over the lung, you get this function, which is um, displayed below. And each peak can be um, quantified. And the parameters of this quantification we use to um, discriminate between healthy and asthmatic animals. You see in this slide um, three curves. The blue one is a control mouse. The red one is an asthmatic mice. A mouse, and the green one is a mouse after, uh, asthmatic mouse after treatment. And what you can see is that the asthmatic mouse has um, a higher baseline. That's called air trapping. So the air cannot be exhaled during uh, the expiration phase completely. The peaks are smaller. That's partially because there is less air in the lung and also because there is more tissue due to the swelling. And you also see that the peak is more asymmetric. So there is a prolonged expiration uh, phase, which is 
related to the reduction of elastic recoil in asthma. And you can also see that we can use that for quantification of therapy response because the green curve of the treated mouse is use, uh, looks more likely like the, um, the control mouse, and there's even more air inside, so it's more a little bit of overcompensation. We compared that with the usually approach of whole body platysmography, and we found that our measurement is even more sensitive than that. Um, we also did other comparison, like the bronchial alveol alveolar lavage. So basically, we washed out cells from the lung and counted them. And what you can see from the BIL results is that there is not much of a difference between the treated mouse in the middle, uh, the, the group of the treated mice in the middle, and the asthmatic mice in terms of uh, eosinophils and total immune cells. If you do a an histology analysis, then you see there is um, partially or even a successful different uh, treatment result. So there is a difference between the asthmatic and the treated mice in terms of um, inflammation. And if you use the, our lung function approach, you see that is there a partially uh, successful treatment. So. The summary of that is that you need to have different readouts targeting different um, yeah, features of the disease. Because if you focus on uh, only one of them, then you will maybe misjudge uh, the, the, the success of your treatment. So the measuring of lung function is really important. And the same we see again for these um, recovered mice. And you see that. Um, after one, uh, 121 days, all parameters have, um, are back to the control group, which is represented by the red line, but one parameter not, that's the air trapping parameter in the um, lower right corner of the graph. So that means that there is no signs of inflammation anymore, but there is still a reduction of elastic recall. And that's something we know from the patient, but we were never able to reproduce that in, uh, in mice, and we were never able to measure that. And now we can, using the, the micro CT for lung function measurement, we can not only do that, uh, we can also do that in vivo. And that would be a very nice tool to uh, focus on treatment for this um, late phase of asthma. We correlated these findings with a synchrotron radiation micro CT which we already have ex uh, established to study asthmatic uh, mice. And we found a very nice um, correlation between the ratio of air to soft tissue in uh, these ex vivo scans with the air trapping parameter measured in vivo. And this, this um, ratio between air and soft tissue is related to our preparation scheme of the specimen. So we keep the lung in situ and we inflate the lung with air with a constant pressure. And the interesting thing is that the former asthmatic mice, so the recovered mice, they have a higher air content than the, the, the healthy mice, which is kind of uh, contraintuitive, but it points to a, lo a loss in um, elastic recoil of the lung, so it can be inflated more with the same pressure. And that correlates perfectly with the in vivo measurement. So we can validate the, um, our in vivo findings. And again, we have for the first time a tool to measure this reduction in elastic recoil with a high sensitivity in vivo using the perking Elmer micro CT system. And we also found the reason for this reduction in elastic recoil by um, hist histological an analysis of the lungs. And the first staining in the upper row is a so-called masnatrichrome staining, and it stains fibers. So we don't see a difference in the amount of fibers, um, which is usually the case for strong mouse models because they tend to develop fibrosis. So there is no fibrosis in our asthma model. Um, the next staining in the central row is for alpha um, smooth muscle, muscle actin. So there is a significant difference in that. And the last one is for elastic fibers. And what we see is there's still 
120 days after the last asthma attack, there is a strong reduction in elastic fiber. So our hypothesis is that during the inflammation in the acute phase, um, the elastic fibers get destroyed and they will never ever be recovered. And that's probably also the reason uh, why this happens in patients. And maybe we can find a treatment to prevent the elastic fibers from being destroyed. The software we used for that is open access, so you can look up the open access paper and you find a link to the software. One word uh, to the dose. So you would think a lung function measurement based on X-rays is maybe not a good idea because of the radiation dose. But we found out that we can do these recordings with a very low amount of radiation because that's a statistic measurement and the dose has not that much uh, influence on this um, average brightness uh, over the whole area of the lung. So we only use six milligray of dose which is much less than you would apply for standard um, in vivo CT. So that's the reason why we believe we can do that longitudinal multiple times without applying too much dose. So in summary, we use the perkin elmer quantum micro CT for um, recording of the movies of the breathing mouse. We can record up to 34 seconds with very low dose. And these movies can be used to address lung function and can also be um, used to derive parameters. <coughs> and these parameters can be used to discriminate asthma mouse from um, uh, mouse models of different severity. We can address therapy response. And we were for the first time able to reveal persistent loss in elastic recall in mice recovered from asthma. And there is a new system the quantum GX um, that records even faster, so that will be even more beneficial for, <coughs> for this purpose. And now I'd like to hand you over to the next speaker, Sasha Belenkov, who will introduce you uh, how um, the perkin elmer quantum CT can be used for three-dimensional analysis of lung disease. Thank you very much for your introduction. My presentation will be uh, the introduction to the Quantum GX2 in vivo micro CT system uh, from Torkin Elmer. Uh, this system has a very small footprint. It doesn't need a dedicated room to be operated. Uh, the system can be used for uh, different animal models uh, from uh, mice, rats, rabbits, guinea pigs, uh, the system operates with a two-dimensional CMOS detector, which is called sometimes a flat panel detector, uh, with a large array. And this array can be uh, used to acquire images with high temporal resolution. So the frame rate on the flat panel detector uh, can be achieved up to 117 frames per second. Uh, the system has a variable geometry and uh, can allow the user uh, to change magnification and uh, achieve fields of view from 18 to 86 millimeters. Also, the system can be used for really high image uh, acquisitions. For example, uh, images can be acquired in uh, less than uh, four seconds. Also, the resolution on the system can be achieved down to 2.3 microns of voxel size. X-ray detector uh, and uh, X-ray filters can be operated with the filters, so we allow to use up to six different filters to change the energy on the X-ray source. Also, the system has an integrated uh, graphical processing unit for image reconstruction, and images can be reconstructed in the volumes up to 1,000 uh, voxels or sub-volume reconstructions with 8,000 voxels. And, of course, the system can be used not only for anatomical imaging, but also for functional imaging. For example, the system can be used with the retrospective reconstructions for cardiac and respiratory um, imaging. So the basic principle of the MicroCT operation is the same as on most of the MicroCT systems. Uh, this was the animation, but this animation is not working. So the the imaging subject is placed in between the x-ray source and the detector, and then the x-ray source and the detector 
They rotate around the subject, acquiring multiple projection images. And uh, images are acquired over 360 degree rotation. Once all the projection images are acquired, they will be reconstructed using the graph processing unit and the images can be displayed in transverse, coronal, and sagittal orientation. Uh, the system, as I mentioned previously, has a variable geometry, which will allow an operator to place a subject uh, near to the X-ray source to achieve high magnification, or to place um, an imaging object away from the X-ray source to acquire large fields of view. Uh, in this sense, the system uh, can be uh, compared with a microscope with multiple objectives. For example, with low magnification, the user can get high uh, image uh, field of view, and with the high magnification, the, the user can get really high magnification with a small field of view. And as such, the system can be used for various types of imaging applications that would range from imaging trabecular bone structures, uh, imaging cardiac, uh, imaging respiratory activities, uh, measuring uh, total body fat. And some of these applications, for example, for imaging fat, do not require high resolution, but they do require large fields of view. And contrary trabecular bone analysis will not require imaging large fields of view, as the size of the trabecular structures and the bones themselves are quite small, but the resolution will be required uh, at about 10 or maybe 15 micrometers. So the system should be able to get this resolution for both uh, trabecular analysis uh, with high resolution imaging and with low resolution imaging for uh, full body imaging. One should also notice that with the high magnifications, uh, images will be acquired over a longer period of time and as such radiation to the animal will be higher. So with the help of the various uh, geometry, we can also image different species, for example, mice, rats, guinea pigs. And uh, the system comes with different bore covers. So we have bore co covers for small animals. We have bore co covers for uh, sample imaging. So and with these bore covers, we can also use different uh, animal beds. As you can see, the system is equipped with an integrated anesthesia unit, so the animals can be put on a gas anesthesia, for example, isoflurane anesthesia, and then can be uh, imaged uh, inside the, the cabinet, which is fully uh, shielded, so the operator is not exposed to ionizing radiation. <clears throat> the system um, also operates with the microfocus X-ray source, and it's quite important to have a system equipped with microfocus X-ray source if one needs to acquire images at high spatial resolution. For example, if the system doesn't have a microfocus X-ray source, if it's a regular X-ray source, so you can see from this image that X-ray photons can be emitted from a, a relatively large area, and then you will get such an effect as penumbral blurring. And this penumbral blurring effect will degrade image quality, and uh, such images may not be useful, uh, for example, for high resolution imaging of trabecular structures. The resolution of the system can be verified uh, using one of those uh, phantoms. Uh, this is an example of a bar pattern phantom uh, from the company called QRM. Uh, this phantom has multiple bars spaced at different. Um, uh, distances. So you can see that you, when you can zoom in on the middle portion of the phantom, and if you can see that some of these bars can be resolved, so this is the resolution that the system can achieve. So this is a very useful tool uh, to check the capability of the instrument and uh, for the quality control. Uh, I also mentioned that the system, uh, the Quantum GX2 system, is equipped with a flat panel detector. And the flat panel detector is a different type of the X-ray so energy detector than a CCD-based detector. Uh, most of the commercially available micro-CT systems are equipped with the CCD-based detectors. Uh, this is relatively old technology. And um, in order to record uh, the images on such systems, 
uh, these systems employ image demagnification approach where the image from the large area scintillator needs to be demagnified uh, to be collected, the signal can be collected on the CCD detector. And during this demagnification process, image quality can be degraded, uh, also image intensity can be lost, and usually the micro CT systems equipped with the CCD-based detector, they would require longer imaging times and as such longer exposure of the animal to ionizing radiation. Uh, the advantage of the X-ray um, detector based on the flat panel uh, technology is that there's no need for image demagnification, so the energy can be more efficiently recorded and at relatively short uh, exposure times. Another advantage of this type of the detector is that uh, the images can be rapidly read from the read from the detector. For example, uh, or the flat panel detector based on the uh, binning used can read images from 50 to 100 times faster than the CCD based detector. So for example, with the large binning on the flat panel detector, we can record up to 117 images per second. And if you compare it to the CCD based detector, CCD based, CCD based detectors uh, usually record uh, from 3 uh, to 20 frames per second. So as such, temporal resolution may not be uh, sufficient to image, uh, for example, animal supplications like cardiac. And um, I also mentioned that the system is equipped with the retrospective gating and why the retrospective or any type of gating uh, is required is that the, when we image small animals, the heart is beating, the, uh, the lungs are also uh, changing the position. And if uh, no care is taken about compensating for the movement of the organs, uh, you will get the image similar to this one. So you can see that the borders of the lung are blurred, uh, the interventricular septum and the left and right ventricles, they're also not well delineated. So uh, this is the kind of the image that uh, you will get if no care is taken about the gating. Um, most of the current approaches uh, rely on um, the use of the external monitoring equipment such as ECG or respiratory triggers uh, to record the cardiac activity and to record respiratory activity. Uh, and this technique requires uh, the use of the electrodes attached to the animal, also attachment of the, some respiratory pads. And of course, there is a need for the operator to learn how to use these devices. Sometimes the use of these devices can be uh, affected by electric noise. Sometimes the electrodes can uh, fall off. So it takes time to set up uh, everything before you start imaging the animal. And sometimes through, uh, throughput of such uh, imaging procedures uh, significantly reduced. With the quantum uh, GX2 systems, we do not require the user to use external monitoring equipment, although the equipment can be used. We have ports where the uh, wires and cables can be put through the scanner. Uh, so it's not a problem, but it's not mandatory to use the sort of the equipment for uh, gating, uh, for cardiac and respiratory gating. Uh, everything that the user uh, is required to do is to place a small region of interest, ROI, so you can see this uh, outlined in uh, yellow, uh, over the region of the diaphragm and the heart, and then the software in the background will record uh, changes of the intensity in this uh, region of interest and will uh, figure out which frames belong to which cardiac or respiratory cycle. For example, large spikes shown on the graph, they represent respiratory movements, and small spikes on the graph, they represent cardiac movements. And uh, the systolic and systolic phases are on top, and, and diastolic phases are below. So the user does not need to uh, perform any of the uh, selection of these projections manually. The software, the gating software, uh, will, perf will perform a projection sorting and then the reconstruction automatically. So the process of image acquisition and then uh, image reconstruction is seamless uh, with no requirement uh, for the user to enter any kind of parameters. 
this is an example of the image which can be acquired on the Quantum GX2 system. Uh, you can see one of the um, uh, projection, uh, not projection, the the, the cross uh, uh, cross axial images. So you can see nice delineation of the soft tissues, uh, bone tissues, uh, enhanced blood vessels. Uh, the image analysis is used on the um, uh, different uh, techniques uh, which rely on intensity gating. For example, voxels in the image of uh, around minus 1,000 Hounsfield units, they are represented by air. Uh, voxels with the intensity levels above 1,000 Hounsfield units, they represent bone images. Uh, if the tissue, soft tissue, has a value of zero Hounsfield units, uh, if um, lung has a mixture of air and soft tissue, the values will be in between zero and minus 1,000 Hounsfield units. And if the contrast agent is injected, the amount of enhancement in the blood vessels will be proportional uh, to the amount of iodine injected to the animal. And on average, one milligram of iodine per ml will give you uh, enhancement values of approximately 30 Hounsfield units. So then the image can be... Um, plotted as a distribution uh, histogram of values. So this is distribution uh, of different intensity values. And you can see that um, each tissue compartment has its signature. For example, air is on the left and uh, bone is on the right. Uh, in between, we have a tissue. So they, they are represented by nice distributions. And if you place uh, different thresholds around these distributions, these organs can be delineated their mean values can be calculated, standard deviations, and also uh, volumes of the structures can be calculated. Uh, instead of performing external reconstructions, uh, this is an example on the left, you can also perform internal reconstructions, and then you can perform uh, so-called virtual endoscopic views. So in this case, no uh, monitoring devices needed to be placed inside the animal. So it's just the use of the same projection images, but a slightly different reconstruction technique. And then we can look through different organs uh, like blood vessels. We can take a look uh, through the um, airways and to see uh, what is the uh, type of the disease uh, can be visible from the inside. Uh, some sort of the uh, reconstructions can also allow uh, exploration of uh, uh, tree. These can be airway trees. This can be vascular trees. Uh, people can calculate the number of branches, bifurcations, uh, also the tortuosity of uh, some segments. Uh, this is very useful technique uh, to look at abnormal blood vessels. So if one is interested to perform such calculations. The system um, with live animals can be also used uh, with external ventilators. Um, so many people know that, for example, lung diseases, they're not homogeneous diseases, they're highly heterogeneous. And if one uses a ventilator, the ventilator will all only deliver, uh, for example, compliance, resistance, uh, total values, global values. Of, of the lung, but if uh, some portions of the lung are affected differently uh, by the disease, and then if disease is not significantly present, present so overall value uh, may not be representative. But with the help of the micro CT and the ventilator, uh, you can perform regional analysis of particular uh, lobes in the lung and you can calculate uh, lobular uh, compliance values, for example, resistance values. Uh, here's an example of the animal uh, presented with emphysema. Emphysema was uh, induced by injection of the allostase to the animal. Uh, and you can see that the images uh, can be reconstructed at different phases. Um, here we have an example of an inspiratory and, and expiratory uh, phases. Uh, the image below uh, was supposed to show uh, four uh, 4D image, so this is the changes in uh, lung volume during the respiratory cycle. Uh, another condition which is commonly used uh, is the pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, the fibrosis in mice was induced by uh, administration of uh, bleomycin. Bleomycin is an anti-cancer drug 
uh, and one of the side effects of this drug is the development of pulmonary fibrosis. And you can see from the example below, after the pleomycin was injected, the, 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 the right lung of the animal was uh, heavily affected by the treatment, but the left lung was spared. So you can see uh, increase in uh, lung attenuation values in the right lung, and you can see the involvement of pretty much all the lobes. Even the cardiac lobe has disappeared from the image because it was totally non aerated There was a collapse in the lobe, and it's not visible. And to compensate for the function, you can see that... Uh, uh, the left lobe of the lung is compensating with the hyperaeration, and this hyperaeration can be noticed on the histogram, uh, which is presented on the right hand side. Longitudinal imaging can be also performed using the system. Uh, this is an example of a, a lung tumor model. So the tumor was uh, injected to the animal, and the tumor. Uh, tumor cells were also expressing a gene called luciferase. Uh, in the presence of the substrate luciferase, luciferin, luciferase will produce light signal. Of course, light signal cannot be uh, recorded with the micro CT instrument, and the researchers can use one of the Perkin Elmer instruments called IVIS, IVIS Lumina or IVIS Spectrum, uh, which will record. Uh, intensity of the, in, uh, of, the, of the light emitted by tumor cells, and the intensity of the light will be proportional to the intensity of, uh, to the number of the tumor cells. So you can see that um, on the upper uh, side image, we can see normal healthy lung parenchyma, which is disappearing over time during to, due to the growth of the tumors in this, in this model. And also uh, the images from the micro CT and from the spectrum, IVA spectrum system can be combined together to perform image co-registration. And the image below uh, represents a combination of the skeletal structures and also pseudocolor um, images of the tumor cells themselves. And what is interesting about this uh, image, the graph on the right hand side uh, shows a decrease in a healthy lung parenchyma uh, proportionally to the increase in the tumor cell number. And you can see regardless of the number of uh, X-ray examinations, uh, X-ray um, imaging did not affect the growth of the tumor. And you, can know, you know that the ionizing radiation, the radiation from X-ray sources uh, can stop tumors from growing. So the amount of radiation that we deliver during uh, quantum GX2 examination is very low and is not capable of affecting uh, these imaging protocols uh, affecting the, the growth of the tumor. Uh, the image below shows a different model. It's uh, a bone metastasis model. In this case, tumor cells also express luciferase, which can be imaged on the spectrum IVIS system. And in this uh, situation, you can uh, locate the spread of the tumors to skeletal structures. And also with the micro CT, you can examine uh, the effect of the tumor cells uh, on bone growth or uh, maybe to study the osteolytic process induced uh, by these tumor cells. Uh, and at the same time, uh, images of the chest of the mouse or the rat also the images of the heart and uh, cardiac imaging can be also performed with the micro CT. Uh, so for this, you would need to inject some contrast agents. Uh, one of the most commonly used contrast agents is iodine. Iodine has a high electron density and will uh, cast a shadow on the X-ray image. And when this image is reconstructed, you can uh, delineate different um, heart chambers and main blood vessels, and micro CT, the quantum uh, GX2 micro CT system, delivers images at isotropic resolution, so the dimension of the voxels in all X, Y, and Z directions, they are uh, isotropic, same in size, and hence the image quality that you can see uh, on this slide. So you can see nice uh, delineation of large and small blood vessels, you can see beautiful trabeculation of the left and right uh, myocardial structures. 
So the images can be also used to calculate uh, changes in volume during the cardiac cycle. So the next example shows uh, a mouse model, uh, actually it's a rat model with the pulmonary hypertension. So the control animal uh, is shown uh, on the top panel and the, the cross, cross axial and um, uh, coronal uh, cross sections, they show the heart at different time points from end diastolic to end systolic and again to end diastolic phase. That's only 10 images which are shown, but uh, the images can be acquired at really high temporal resolution up to 117 frame, frames per second. And this will allow multi-phase reconstruction and analysis of all cardiac uh, chambers in time. So we can calculate the volumes of the left, right ventricle, uh, left and right atria. And we can also plot the values of the volumes and we can also calculate the, the first derivative and uh, find what is the flow uh, values during the systolic and diastolic function in the heart. And the image below shows the animal affected by the disease, pulmonary hypertension. And we can see uh, all the signatures of this disease, for example, hypertrophy of the right ventricle, uh, increase in the thickness of the myocardial wall, which can be also measured with the quantum uh, GX2 system. And as well, we can calculate uh, some functional parameters that represent uh, systolic and diastolic function. And uh, with this slide, I wanted to conclude my uh, presentation. And thank you very much for your interest in the webinar. And uh, if you have uh, any questions, please uh, ask me the questions during the, uh, the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, in this webinar, I will talk about the in vivo micro CT as a powerful tool to non-invasively monitor lung disease, and in particular, lung fibrosis. Briefly, I will go through the human idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, IPF, and how preclinical animal models are needed to recapitulate the disease in preclinical trials. Second, I will present data obtained using quantum micro CT to monitor longitudinal lung fibrosis and response to treatment. And in conclusion, I will summarize the benefits of using micro CT technique for drug discovery. Human IPF is a progressive disease that results in a reversible loss of lung function. The median survival is around three to five years. And nintedanib and perfenidone are the only two drugs approved by FDA against IPF. So there is a urgent need to understand more about IPF pathobiology and to find out new biomarkers. The use of new imaging approaches, such as micro CT, could increase a lot the, translation, the translational value of preclinical trials. Animal models play a crucial role in drug discovery because of their utility to make predictions for human clinical outcomes. We are deeply investigating different animal models of lung fibrosis induced by bleomycin administration which is known to be one of the most used profibrotic agents in the literature. I will focus on results from the IT model where bleomycin is given intratracheally and from the pump model where bleomycin is given systemically by the implant of an osmotic pump. The use of micro CT as a fast and automated tool gives the possibility to overcome problems related to the two-dimensional histology studies. Even if it remains the gold standard technique, the micro CT offers with a 3D view to study the complexity of the pathology.
High resolution CT has gained really a central role in the diagnosis of patients with IPF, where normal lung tissue is replaced by new collagen deposition. In human patients are asked to be in total lung capacity during the HRCT, and their frequency distribution histograms of, of unfilled units appear like that, as you can see on the left side in an healthy subject. In IPF patients, on the contrary, and during disease progression, the typical WIP pattern caused a shift of the histograms towards zero, with an attenuation of the signal. But what happened in mice and in preclinical studies? Mice are imaged under gas anesthesia, normally breathing, and this is, why the this is the reason why a control mouse has unfilled unit distribution with a mean around minus 600. Once mice are treated with bleomycin and develop fibrosis, because of the loss of air, they show a shift to the right of the histogram distribution. For the quantitative assessment of the lung parenchyma, we applied unfilled unit clinical ranges published by Gattinoni and RANG resulted in the division of normally aerated tissue segmented from minus 900 to minus 500 unfilled units and poorly aerated region segmented from minus 500 to minus 100 unfilled units. And this helps in determining different degrees of variation in a given tissue fraction. The best should be to set up new ranges to use in preclinical studies based on data from every animal model. So in the next section, I will illustrate some experimental results. We applied the analysis method I explained before to image obtained from bleomycin IT model and we were able to follow fibrosis progression in the same subject over the time, starting at baseline at 7 days, 14, up to 21 days, highlighting the capability of micro CT to visualize longitudinally the progressive anatomical changes of the lung architecture. The last plot showed the quantification of normally and poorly aerated tissue as a percentage on the total lung volume of bleomycin treated mice in a time course study. The Ashcroft score obtained by histology was in agreement with microCT findings, showing a maximum peak at 14 days and a tend to decrease at a later time point. Moreover, to support microCT data, we aligned the histology slide with the same 2D slides from CT scans. A significantly visible correlation has been found between poorly aerated tissue and the position of fibrotic regions in the histological slides. And notably, severe fibrotic lesions classified with an Ashcroft around 5 6 up to 8, lead to a loss of signal detection in CT images. This is due probably to a patchy distribution of fibrotic foci in lamp parenchyma caused by bleomycin give intertrachially. To overcome this issue, we applied the same method of analysis to images from bleomycin pump model which has a less severe fibrosis but a more uniform lesion distribution because of a constant and systemic release of bleomycin for seven days. We followed fibrosis progression from day seven when the disease is well established up to 28 days. Notably, the total lung parenchyma is completely detectable because of the homogeneous distribution of the lesions with a progressive attenuation of the signal compared to the saline. The quantification of poorly rated regions at 28 days resulted in an increase up to 
Mice treated with the antifibrotic compounds, nintedanib, showed a significant decrease of poorly aerated region, with an inhibition of 67% at the higher dose of 60 mg per kg. According to this finding, histology ASHCRAF score data showed similar results. Nintedanib showed to be effective in reducing ASHCRAF with an inhibition of 39%. Poorly rated regions positively correlate with ASHCRAF score with an R squared of 0.6 on over the experimental groups. In 2017, ATS guidelines on the use of animal models in preclinical studies for the assessment of potential therapies against pulmonary fibrosis have been published. The document highlights the importance of practical aspects related to the models, such as the blomycin route of delivery, but also the pivotal role of imaging techniques as a preclinical endpoint. Therefore, we decided to investigate a third MIRI model of lung fibrosis induced by bleomycin orally administered with a micro-CT. Longitudinal studies and pharmacological response to the nintedanib treatment are ongoing in our labs. In conclusion, I would like to summarize some of the main advantages to use MicroCT in preclinical research. MicroCT provides the researcher with high-resolution 3D imaging information, and it can be used in longitudinal studies to follow disease progression and drug efficacy. Importantly, the use of clinical endpoints in preclinical studies improves the translatability of results. The micro-CT advantage over histology is that it is a non-invasive technique which allows researchers to use less animals according to the free art principle. Below, you also can find references link to published data and methodology. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Duleen, Dr. Belenkov, and Dr. Ruschetti for your presentations. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. Our speakers will address as many questions as time permits. First question is for you, Francesca. Uh, what level of expertise is needed to run the quantum and analyze the data? Um, we from Perkin Almer has a user-friendly software which really helps researchers to perform imaging at a very high resolution. And I would say also that data analysis is facilitated by the use of an analysis software which gives the possibility to use a semi-automatic segmentation tool to reconstruct 3D images and also to have histograms of unfilled unit distribution from different tissues. Thank you. Christian, this next one looks like it's for you. What range of radiation doses did the test subjects typically receive? Uh, the quantum micro CT has different protocols, and the, the, the protocol with the lowest radiation dose is an acquisition of 17 seconds and it needs 15 milligray, which is really, really low. And um, high resolution um, protocols need about one gray, which is still quite low for um, animal um, scans. Thank you. Uh, Sasha, the next one is for you. What are the possibilities for using prospective gating to adjust for the breathing cycles of the test subjects? Uh, yes, uh, so um, prospective gating is not possible on the quantum GX2. Uh, uh, prospective gating requires a triggering device that will tell the instrument uh, at uh, respiratory or uh, cardiac phase um, the images should be acquired. 
So instead of this, uh, the quantum is acquiring images in a retrospective way. Uh, and in this manner, more information uh, about the breathing and cardiac cycle can be uh, acquired. So the information from uh, retrospective gating has more value. Thank you. This next one is for you too. What possibilities are there for using a ventilator within the quantum imaging experiments, for example, FlexiVent? Yes, um, any uh, ventilator, including a FlexiVent ventilator, can be used with a quantum. Uh, the images uh, will be acquired in a list mode and uh, will be gated retrospectively, so all the phases can be reconstructed and the, the information from, from the flex event uh, can be used uh, to calculate pulmonary resistance and pulmonary compliance. Thank you. Christian, this one is for you. Could the same lung function measurement be used in humans? Uh, since we use a very low dose for the lung function measurement, mm -hmm. it could be applied in humans. And there are actually some projects doing um, X-ray-based lung function measurements in, in humans. The ultimate goal would be to do this um, with CT, so four-dimensional imaging. But yes, it can be done. Thank you. Thank you. Next one for you, too. Could the same approach be used in other lung disease models like fibrosis? We are actually working on uh, also do lung function measurements in fibrosis mouse models. Um, so yes. It can be applied in any lung disease model that change the lung function. Great, thank you. It looks like we have time for one more question. It will be for you, Sasha. Is dual energy imaging possible? Uh, Quantum GX2 instrument has a variable X-ray source, and the voltage on the generator can be changed. Uh, as such, the energy uh, can be adjusted. Uh, also, the Quantum GX2 instrument has uh, various filters, and those filters can be also used uh, to shape the energy of the X-ray. Once again, thank Dr. Duleen, Dr. Belenkov, and Dr. Roschetti for their presentations. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today will be addressed by the speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. We would like to thank our sponsor, Perkin Elmer, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through June 2019. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.